can say hi. Okay, ready? Yes, sir. Hi, welcome back to Dev's Play Season 2. We are going to be playing a lot of fun games, and especially uh, games that are uh, of the lost, I don't say lost genre, but platformers, that, uh, especially ones that are inspirational to Psychonauts, because we're doing some Psychonauts work uh, now. And we're bringing back some of the people that help make those games, especially our special guest here today, Mr. Ted Price. Well, I'd want to make it clear I didn't help make those games, but... You didn't help make what games? Well, you said oh, help make those games that you were, were inspired by for Psychonauts. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you said we helped make Psychonauts. Okay, this no, is really did, going did way you, off. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, Ted helped make Psychonauts. Well, yeah. in an indirect way. <laughs> you know, very inspirational. Um, and we're going to be playing today, we're going to be playing Spyro Dragon. And we have... Justin Honiger from Double Fine will be doing some expert playing so that I don't have to do two things at once because I can't talk and play games at the same time, especially when I've been on the airplane as many times as I have in the last two days. So um, can you set like, some of the context for this of this game, like yeah. what you were doing right before this and how this came about? So this was the second game that we made with Universal Interactive Studios. What was the, the first game? The first game was Disruptor. It was a first person mm -hmm. shooter. And that was released in 1996. I started the company in 94, and Al Hastings, who's one of my partners, along with his brother Brian Hastings, and I, had, we had put together this demo for Disruptor and drove up to LA to show Universal Interactive, who at the point was a very small company, small group within Universal. That's when we met Mark Cerny, who has been a friend. The famous Mark Cerny. The famous Mark Cerny. who has been, been making a, games since he was like 16, yeah. right? Marble Madness. One of the smartest guys in the industry, uh, a mentor of mine, and a guy who really helped show all of us at Insomniac, you know, good design, good production. So that day that we walked into Universal, Jason Rubin and Andy Gavin from Naughty Dog were walking out, having just showed Way of the Warrior, mm -hmm. the game they made in college, to mm -hmm. Universal. And Universal signed them. They did Crash Bandicoot. We mm -hmm. presented Disruptor. They signed us, we, and we made Disruptor. This, so. so wait, they did not make Way of the Warrior? I think they published they published Way of the War. Oh, it was already done. I, yeah, it was already okay. finished, and that was the first game that Universal may have published. Mm -hmm. And then they moved on to Crash Bandicoot. So we were actually all working in the same basic place. And it's crazy that your relationship goes back that far. Yeah, it's like long. you and Jason, I always think of your company as like like how tightly woven they've been over the years, and then it went all the way back to that first meeting. And by the way, the stuff at the microphone here is hilarious, this interview stuff. This was uh, the idea of Ellen Mendron, or maybe Brian Hastings, I'm not sure. It was, it was, we were trying to come up with this idea for how we start the game that in a, in a non-expected way. And so Yeah, the I mean, that seems was, way ahead of its time in that it's like more pop culture-y than like uh, video games. Is that, what year was this again? This was, we 96? started making this in 96. Okay. And it was released in 98. Mm -hmm. So... It's like a reality TV show, or like a, almost, it's kind of feeling to it. Before. It kind of did, you know, and that... What about Nasty Nord? I'm <laughs> oh, going after So you hear that voice, right? <laughs> that voice uh, was Wood. Carlos Alice Rocky, who was, I think, who was, I think that was his voice, the voice of the uh, Chihuahua on Taco Not Bell Yokiero commercials. Not Yokiero Taco Bell. Yes. Yes. He, he didn't, did he pass away? No, the dog passed away. Did he? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Sorry just, to bring this whole thing down sad. with the dead chihuahua, but um, the, so the actor's still alive. Let's, we'll check I believe, we'll check I those believe facts. he is. And I we'll don't cut think that part out if he much actually older died. than we are, so hopefully we'll, he's still alive. But this space. This was, and then uh, that portal that you saw Spyro going through, this was one of the big pieces of tech that Al Hastings wrote. We were trying to figure out how to make these transitions between levels, something other than the black loading, loading screen, screen that you always see, or that we've been seeing. And so he came up with this way to display skyboxes in the portal, and then we made this transit. He figured out how to make this very seamless transition between levels, just having Spyro fly through the sky. That was Al, and he was on your team, or he was part he of is. the He is. Okay. Al is still our, there? Oh, yeah. Al is a partner, uh, as is Brian right. Hastings, his, his brother. Al is the chief architect for all of our engines. So Al wrote mm -hmm. this engine early on, and the whole point of this engine was to create long views, because there really hadn't been long views on the PlayStation 1. Mm -hmm. Nobody had been making games that... Can you explain that technical term to, not me, of course, sure. but to... 
<laughs> you mean like that you could yeah, see the distance that and uh, yeah. So most most of the games exactly. So most of the games were very claustrophobic mm -hmm. on the PlayStation One back then, or they just weren't displaying a whole lot. So having a dragon who could fly around and, and charge through environments, could not we realized, be in a closet. We realized it could not be in a closet. Yes. So Al began this making this engine after just uh, building off of Disruptor, and ended up uh, with something that could display green rolling hills in the distance, and as you get later, mm -hmm. longer, uh, further in the game, much larger environments. Mm -hmm. Right, and Disruptor was a shooter, right? Cause yeah, it was a first-person shooter. Resistance was announced. You're like, we're going back to our roots. Yeah, we're going back. To it was. It was. I remember seeing articles that described it as the best game that nobody's ever heard of. Oh, I've we've won that award a couple times. Have you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, like, it's an honor, isn't it? <laughs> it's like <laughs> it makes you, you feel good. You have to word it that way. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, why does dragon hate frogs so much? Can you explain? Well, that? they're they're norks. That's, they're not frogs. They're not frogs. They're norks. They sound like frogs. They look like frogs. Oh, you're talking about the little the little ones. The green ones. Sorry. Yes. I've Those taken are frogs. About, these are frogs. <laughs> okay. And in yeah. every level, we would have fodder, and that was important for us. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they're sheep. Sometimes they're frogs. Sometimes they're other things. I thought you were talking about the Norks, That's here, the, green, the big green guys. They control the... They control the gems. The frogs. Oh, and uh, the gems. And the gems. They don't do much with the frogs. They probably... We missed some opportunities here. We could have had them eating the frogs, and then oh. it would have been weird because Spyro <laughs> would be killing the frogs, Norks were eating the frogs, uh -huh. who's good, who's bad. Would have been a good morality play. How did you guys come up with the old dragon idea? Like, you know, that was one of our artists named Craig Stitt, who, after Disruptor, said... Well... Let me back up a second. Yeah. After Disruptor, it, it didn't do that well, right? And uh, furthermore, it was sort of a dark game, even though parts of it were really cheesy. And <laughs> we were thinking, well, let's do something that's a little different. And Mark Cerny said, hey, you know, Nintendo has a lock on the family-friendly games at this point. Mm -hmm. Nintendo was killing it with family-friendly games. Mm -hmm. There's nothing on PlayStation that will appeal to this audience. You guys should consider doing something. So we. So we got we started brainstorming the four or five of us who were at Insomniac and Craig Stitt, one of our artists, said, "I've always wanted to do a game about dragons," mm -hmm. and and that's where we started. And our first designs for Spyro were an adult dragon, and we were making big, scary-looking dragons. Mm -hmm. And then eventually we realized that wasn't very family-friendly. Let's take them. <laughs> you mean adult adult dragon? Adult what, do you, what do you mean by that adult? Uh, more Just more a big dragon. Bigger, yeah. Bigger. And dragon games at the time there was. Draken? Yeah, I, dra I think Draken was. Draken? Uh, Ozzy's Dark Skies. No, that never came out. Remember that? Ozzy uh, Osbourne was going to do a dragon flight simulator. Did he? Oh, okay. Yeah. That would be cool. <laughs> Panzer Dragoon. Panzer Dragoon. Probably was out around then, maybe. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. Ozzy game would have been cool. But we decided that the dragon had to be cute, and Charles Zimbalis, who is an, an artist and animator in LA, was Don't doing some sketches for us. That was a good demo, though. Of uh, oh yeah, some good drowning sim. Uh, no one can uh, swim in games, it's even dragons. <laughs> he can fly, but when his scales get wet, he like a pixie without the pixie dust. He can't. That's that weird thing about water in video games. It's always toxic. Mm -hmm. I can say that little that little fairy leading you around looks a little bit like the double fine two at a baby logo. That and that's where we got the idea for the double fine two at a baby logo. <laughs> so that's that's sparks. The dragonfly, and uh, we were uh, that. W the idea there was that he gives you hints, etc., and also in illustrates how much health you have. And this is before Navi, right? I think it was is before Navi. I, I don't Oculus? know. Maybe. I mean, not Oculus. Wow. Ocarina of Time. We're always thinking about Oculus now. Uh, Ocarina of Time I was disagree. in. Oh, well, maybe that. Was, I don't know. But I noticed that he's not saying hey. <laughs> He's so not yelling at you. You're obviously Sparks is mute. a little improvement over, yes. over Navi. Are you having trouble with that big belly nork, nark? You can't attack them from the front, only well, the back. See, like, that's, that's what's great. He's, we were trying to figure out how to differentiate these enemies, and so we have enemies you can flame, enemies you can't flame, enemies you can charge, enemies you can't charge. And there were lots, we had lots of debates over how to illustrate that, and so one way is through armor. Yeah, so do you have to sneak behind challenge. that guy? Or do you just run past him? Got to run around him and inflame him in the butt. So the the thing here is, I I think in oh my god, I don't remember that line. Your secret thing with me. I I remember playing this level in particular again and again and again and hearing that line and getting really tired of it. Uh, one thing we actually did in subsequent Spyros was we did change his personality. We got some critique from players that he was 
too cocky and arrogant, and we kind of knew that anyway. Mm. So in subsequent Spyro games, he's much more likable. You're a real comedian sometimes, Bentley. <laughs> likable main characters are, are a good thing, generally. Game characters are, <laughs> you know, you write the dialogue and it sounds like the guy's just being funny, and then when you hear it a bunch of times, you're like, this guy's a jerk. Yeah. This guy's a big jerk. There's a lot of, and, and I think going into the recording studio as well, mm -hmm. there's all that nuance, and then the lines that you pick mm -hmm. in editing. It just, it's a complicated process, and you can really, you can go from this vision of a character to ending up with something completely different. Mm -hmm. These are all the moving parts that end up mm -hmm. um, becoming that little thing on screen. So the ones that use the Elijah, the, is that the post Insomniac Spyros? Or yes. The, okay, yeah. so you didn't get to hang out with them. No. I don't want to rub that in, I got to hang out. <laughs> Sorry you didn't, but uh, we got to hang out with him a little bit. Nice guy. Very nice guy. Yeah. He, he likes games though, too. He loves games. He was a big nerd. Yeah. Yeah, in the best way. So, well, look at all those gems you got. Nice job. Now, now you have to go back. One of the things that we would discuss frequently was the whether collectathons are good or bad. Oh yeah, I and thought about that a lot too. What did you decide? Well, for these games, good. For Ratchet, not so good. <laughs> good relief, because that's what we decided to. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, we. Uh, I really like collecting things. That's I, and some people said that about Psychonauts. There's a lot of collecting in this, and I think it's just there's a couple spots where. Um, it's painful because you need a certain, there's certain blocks that if you don't have enough cobwebs by a certain point, you can't go any farther. And if you hadn't been collecting them all along, you're like, oh, now I just gotta go grind this one. And that, you know, that makes people yeah. really mad about them in general. But um, I enjoy them. I feel like it's just, you're getting paid for being walking around, right? <laughs> it's like, uh, but um, we wanted to do, like it was important for us to like justify their existence and not have them be like, not how to just be like, okay, you're in a new level and you gotta go um, find a hundred radishes and just find. I hope there's no game that actually uses radishes, but. Um, yeah, and it's like, why are you collecting them? Like, I don't know, if you're just collecting them. That's the only reason. But like, having like this, like a real character motivated reason why that is contextualized and thematic, you know, was important. And dragons love to hoard jewels, so that works out, just like smog. Was that the main inspiration for Spyro, was smog? Don't think so. I don't think so. I. Sitting on a pile of gold? No, it was just the general belief that dragons probably like treasure, given all the books and movies mm -hmm. we've you know, seen. Are you going to cook those? So, sheep, right? Sheep play is a big part in our of games. Your big mm -hmm. sheep thing? Yeah, I don't know what it is about sheep. Are there They're any just so innocent. <laughs> no, there weren't any sheep in Disruptor. But it, that would have been cool had we thought to put sheep in Disruptor. Uh, They're fun in there. I don't know why we love to torture sheep, but Did I thought it was, I think it was. I think it was just funny. Were you very, um, did you know the uh, Sucker Punch guys much yeah. at this time? Because they had sheep in, remember Rocket? Oh, we, Robot well, on Wheels? No, we actually didn't meet the Sucker Punch guys until we were in the Ratchet phase. And they were doing the Sly. Yep. But, so we liked, I liked uh, uh, um, Robot on Wheels, Ratchet, wait, I'm not. Rocket. Rocket, mm -hmm. not Ratchet. Oh my God, it's so confusing. But, um, it had it had, a, had puzzles where you had to throw sheep against a sticky wall for anyway. I thought I thought maybe sheep was a theme that you guys all agreed on. <laughs> there nope. were really oh wizards. Wizard yeah Dragons so and wizards. This you know all coming up with the enemies for all these levels would generally consisted of Elan, our, our animator, just making something. <laughs> <laughs> just making something funny. That and saves you a lot of time debating and talking about yeah. concept art. You just like make just make some stuff. Some of the later enemies that in Spyro Three, when we were in the third Spyro, when we were starting to uh, really run out of the standards, were a little bit weird. Like uh, we had a a guy, a, some strange character. I think it was a turtle whose belly would just open, just rip open. Ah. No, it was a was a bear. I don't know. It was a turtle or something, and bats would fly out of it. That was cool and different for Spyro. <laughs> That's a, that, that was a boss? No, it was, an, just a, it was just an enemy. Wow. That sounds gruesome. Like, it was. It sounds was. like something from like John Carpenter's thing. <laughs> it could, there's yeah. There's not a lot of it blood. Was You're saying there's not a lot of blood. There was no blood. It was kind of a cute. No intestines visible. Yeah. Uh, we had, man, we had so many debates on this in particular. Uh, this, how far can you fly? What happens when you actually get to uh, fly into the ocean? I think I may have helped build this level, just put the polygons together, but 
I you, think I remember. You were a level designer? Uh, I, used, I would build environments. So I built in Maya. And I what think. What was your background when you started? Were you a programmer or. Uh, I was a hack. I was just a hack at everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, video games was an opportunity for me to to get slightly better at being. What a did hack. you study in college? English. Oh, of course. All right. <laughs> Makes sense, right? Yeah. But English major too. Wait, they wait. Make now, video what was games. the period between that English and then Disruptor? What was going on there? I was in medical industry. I was. I joined. My uncle had a startup medical company I was in San Diego. That. I was going to guess that. Yeah. yeah that Medicine. Sense. Medicine to games. It was actually, it's a great company, uh, and I learned a lot about medicine. But I re one thing I did learn was that I didn't want to be in medicine mm -hmm. for my whole life. So I was doing things, I was I actually, I, I was making 3D art, I made the cover for a Logitech controller on the side to make some money, <laughs> yeah, goofy stuff. Oh man, and you style that box? I don't, no. I don't, yeah. I was proud of it though, I showed my parents, they thought it was cool. <laughs> and then decided that maybe a video game company would be fun because I played video games all the time. But your first thought was to start a company, not like I'm going to go get a job at some video game company. Yeah. So like, I, I, I should just start a company. I just thought that's what you did. How old are you? 24, God. I think. Oh my God. That's pretty young to start or a company. 23. I don't know. It was, well, I, part of it was I didn't know what I, I mean, you're 23, F. you just don't, yeah. you don't have that's any part limitations. Thing. Yeah, you don't, you don't, you're not aware of all the things that are going to happen later, luckily, because yep. So those guys you started the company with, did you know them at the time, or did you? No, Al Hastings had gone to the same college I did, and but he was five years behind me. But a friend of mine, a friend of my mother's actually back in Virginia, knew his mother. She was bragging to her friends that I had started this big video game company, when in reality it was me in a room with a, <laughs> with a dev kit. And she, her, one of her friends said, oh, my son has a roommate in college who's the, who he says is the most brilliant programmer he's ever, he's ever met. And so I ended up calling Al <laughs> and asked if he was interested in coming out and joining a video game company. He said, so yeah, it was that'd be cool. Parents. Yeah, it was, wow. actually. If it wasn't for like my mom. traditional marriage. Yes. And we hit it off And it worked off. It worked out. It worked out. And he's still rocking it. That's, that's crazy. And we actually, and after Thanks, we had... mom. Yeah, actually. Yeah. I owe a lot to my mom and my <laughs> uncle for getting me out to California. But yeah. uh, after that, after we showed Disruptor to Universal and they actually signed a three game deal with us. The, the f next person we called was Al's brother, Brian Hastings, who's now our chief mm -hmm. creative officer. Mm -hmm. And joined us and we started building Disruptor. So when you got together with the first, you were deciding what kind of game to make. I'd already, I knew I wanted to make a first person shooter. That was something I'd been just inspired by Doom. I've been playing a lot of Doom. Oh, we, know that, we know that guy. Yeah, I, I know guy. John Romero. John Romero, John Romero. I, I remember. Uh, it's very popular. He's a great guy and we, and, I didn't know him at the time, yeah. but after when we built Disruptor, I think we were at GDC in their job fair section, mm -hmm. and a couple of us, we had a TV with Disruptor on it, just playing, trying to lure people over. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it worked, but John and a couple of folks who he worked with walked past it, and he stopped, and he looked at it, and he went, huh, that's pretty cool. And I went, yes, validation! <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. And then you probably dragons are just as cool. You know. I think so, yeah. Well, you know what? A lot of players thought dragons were cool. Um, I, I'm happy that, in particular, the platformer genre, wasn't wasn't dead. I mean, we were, we came way after Mario, and mm -hmm. you know, we were all inspired by Mario and Metroid and, and the games that you know, we were I was playing in college, and. I remember being a little worried that this game was not going to resonate. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it didn't at first. When we released the first Spyro, the sales were pretty bad. Really? I didn't yeah. know that. I thought it did really well. It did. But it, it, this was a game that it just it sold a little bit and then more, and then it just kept on going and going and going. And part of that was the PlayStation 1 really didn't have many family-friendly titles on it. Mm -hmm. And so people who had bought the PlayStation 1 for themselves, who had kids, were recognized that, oh, this is a game that my family and I can play. Mm -hmm. And that uh, that worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. I'm tense because I'm worried you're going to miss this jump. You can do it, you can do it, you, can do it, you got uh, it. Yeah, this was one, I remember focus testing that particular jump, or focus test I think consisted of all of us playing it again and again, and <laughs> realizing <laughs> that it was, was really hard. Was the trick going to the edge where all the gems were? Nice you just don't gem. see the water as you're going off the glide and then sucker punch.
Yeah, those dragons. We, God, we debated, I remember debating for days over the dragon families because all these dragons belong to different family types. Mm -hmm. uh, beast masters and swamp something or other, or now I can't remember any of them. Mm -hmm. But that was fun, actually. That was mm -hmm. that was a really kind of creative moment on the project when we came up with all the different families. The lore of the history of the dragon. Yeah, and, and each of them, yeah, and they all had their, they all had their different characteristics mm -hmm. and different ways of addressing Spyro. At least that's what I recall. They might mm -hmm. all sound the same now. But... Chickens. Uh, Natural enemy of the dragon. Yes. Chickens of uh, matador norks as well. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is Alan just kind of going, going nuts. And remember, this is one, an one guy animated mm -hmm. all the characters in this game. And I think this kind of goes... You know, it's... it's when we think of our teams and mm -hmm. the amount of people it takes to make a game today, at least mm -hmm. a, a console how long game. How it takes to make one character? One character, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy that... I'm going to use this like, when talking to my team. I'm going to be like, <laughs> oh, is that hard? You know, Spyro was done with one animator. And they're going to say, well, how many polygons do you think that guy has? Oh, shh. Yeah. <laughs> Ten? What I do you think his rig looks like? Well, it's about, I don't know, eight bones. We have been thinking about that, that question about... Uh, platformers and family-friendly games a lot, too, because that's what Psychonauts is, is also one of those kind of games, and and it's a genre that I feel like, it always seemed like it was such a natural thing for games. In fact, it, to me, it was games for a long time. Like, that's the game I like to play, and I didn't have a family or anything, but I just, like, I like that, I don't know, that found that kind of aesthetic really um, a place I wanted to spend time in, you yeah. know? So it was really, really fun. And um, it, it, it seemed that later on, after, like, you know, 2000, you know, Four, three. There was this thing where everyone decided games had to be darker and grittier, yeah. and the idea of happy, colorful, stylized graphics, funny games. Be, it seemed like it was not. You couldn't pitch that to a publisher at a certain point yep. anymore. And like, what do you think is behind that? And do you think? Um, do you think? What do you think about that? What's behind it? <laughs> Call of Duty, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's Call of Duty's fault. We're all really comfortable with that. But. Um, um, but you're right. It, it, we had, there was a massive shift, and I remember we, everybody who was making mm -hmm. games that are appeal to a broader audience, got kind of hit with that. So, I mean, maybe culture in general was starting to veer towards more gritty, realistic stuff. Do you think it is true? Like, do you think there really is a? I mean, I guess there's a bigger market for it, and that just that, eighteen to thirty-five year old. Mm -hmm. That's a know. good point, right? But I part of me always wonders if it has to do with. I always guess I, I always thought it had something to do with the way people act in focus groups because no one wants to admit they like a childish thing yep. in a focus group, especially when you get like a bunch of teenage boys in a room. Yeah. No, no one's going to be like, I like the colorful, happy thing. They're all like, oh, I like the toughest. I want the the most the chainsaw with the guns on the chainsaw and the uh, like. Um, I feel like that was not a Gears of War reference. I just I was thinking more of a chainsaw that shot out of the. That's that would whole, be really yeah, cool, that's, actually. Really cool, yeah. Anyway, um, I feel like that. I, I don't know if I can blame it all on focus groups, but like I feel like yeah. there's this thing, something like the Jason talked about once after after Jack. He was saying that even the kids who are like eight, who really are the perfect age for this, aspired to be like their the older kids who played games with guns and and you know driving over people with cars and stuff like that. So. Um, but it seems like if you get like you get an eight-year-old alone to play a game, they would play. They would be super happy playing a, a game like this. But then if there was like a older kid in the room, they wouldn't want to be caught playing a baby game or something like that. You know? That that was what we heard too, and it was hard to accept it really at first because mm -hmm. then we were thinking to ourselves, well, should we be making games for five-year-olds? What's <laughs> what's <laughs> where's the cutoff here? Mm -hmm. And I, we there wasn't really ever an answer. I we had the same problem in the focus groups, by the way, too. Yeah. It was painful to watch focus groups where you would have somebody who was clearly the leader yeah. in the group or appointed yeah. himself or herself the leader and yeah. would say, yeah, I don't play these kind of games or this game just looks like kids' games. And the kids that you've just seen having Enjoying a blast yeah. go like, yeah, this game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My little brother would like it, but who's, who's three. But I, I feel people still like them and they are being underserved. Underserved. I agree. Um, well, then again, I mean, one, one really cool thing has happened, I would pull out my phone if it was easy, mm -hmm. is, is that. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think that what's helping uh, create, I hope, a resurgence in bright, colorful games that don't necessarily have to have 
mature mm -hmm. content are all of these great, vibrant games that you see on the phone. Mm -hmm. And and it there is a mm -hmm. incredibly broad audience beyond the console audience that is interested in, in mm -hmm. those games. And I so and I, I think I hope that a lot of those players are also graduating to consoles as well. And if they're looking for that type of content, then they got Psychonauts, they've got games, you know, the kind of games we make, and lots of others that you see on both Xbox and PlayStation mm -hmm. that are made by smaller teams, but have something really unique and beautiful about them in terms of their the stories that they tell and the mm -hmm. colors that and, and the stylized graphics. Um, I, I love actually going on the PlayStation and Xbox stores and looking for those games, mm -hmm. the independent games, um, that aren't the next shooter. Yeah, I love playing shooters as well. I love yeah. playing you know, greedy RPGs, but that, and that's one of the things that makes it a little hard to analyze markets in that way because when you talk about what will kids like, a, lot, a bunch of adults trying to guess what kids would like and older kids and younger kids, but then as a player myself, feeling totally happy playing what might look like a kid's game. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't play like a little kids game, but like a like Mario Mario 64. Like, and a lot of us, have, a lot of people have grown up now, and they love that a lot of adults that you know are really love those kind of games that I feel like um, would still like them. And it's just I, again, I'm just gonna blame focus groups. Let's just blame them. Oh, <laughs> well, then I think there are other games too that are helping. I, Ori oh, mm -hmm. is a great example of a game that's not not it, it has some dark parts to it, but it's a broad, broadly appealing game. Mm -hmm. And it's old school in terms of its approach, right? It's a Metroidvania game. Mm -hmm. But to me, it did really well. And to me, it shows that there's absolutely still a market out there of people who want to play mm -hmm. colorful, mm -hmm. uh, non-mature games. And even like uh, Sunset Overdrive. Like, that's one of the things I liked about that game was that it's obviously a mature game, but it's, it's not like you're playing in a, in a big trench of mud the entire game. Yeah. You're not covered in like grid. It's like it's it's bright and it's colorful and it actually has a um, it's not really it's not it's mature but it's not mean spirited or nihilistic in any way. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like it's a very like there's silly parts to that. It's very silly in a lot of, you a know lot what of silly I mean? parts. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't know I think that similar with like B B Brutal Legend like that's a mature game but I feel like I don't know. It doesn't take itself completely seriously, and that's yeah. that's what's fun about games like Brutal Legend or Sunset, mm -hmm. where you can laugh with the characters, and you can. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's an, it's an escape. It's not a dark escape. It's more of a kind of a breath of fresh air type escape where mm -hmm. if you've had a tough day, and you want to do some grinding or whatever, you can turn on one of those games. Mm -hmm. Spyro. Well, it's awesome spending time with Spyro. I feel like. <laughs> We may not finish I, the whole game unless you can speed run the rest of it. I wonder no, what players. I, my cousin, not me. <laughs> I'd love to know what players actually, your your watchers think about a game like this, where at the time, what you're seeing are really detailed environments, and we were staring at deserts and mm -hmm. these very very uh, simple meadows. But for us, we were drawing as much as we could possibly draw. I mean, that's. I mean, this is you know a year. With the, look look at that guy's diving under the tents. That's so much detail and. But today's players, you know, I mean, for me too. I mean, like he just flashes of... butt at you. Yes. He just mooned you. This is not a. This is a mature game. <laughs> that was like full on frog nudity right there, or norks. We got that. We got that. We one saw some nork already. nethers right there. Oh man, well, this is awesome. Thank you for playing Spyro with us. And thank you for telling all the stories. Thanks for letting me talk about it. This is this is a blast for me. Thank you for playing. Of course. Nice job. Nice job, everybody. And next time we're gonna play Ratchet, right? I look at over there, just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that would make sense. Since you're great. already here. Yeah. Thank you. That'd be great. I'm gonna act like this is the end, even though we're just gonna play Ratchet right now. Shake my hand. Oh, sorry. It's gonna be awkward if you don't shake my hand. Ah!